Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Bill Even, your CEO at the Port Chekhov here in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, with today's national webinar uh, around the Ukraine-Russia war and the meat and livestock value chain. And then, of course, also uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Steve Meyer on a very bullish uh, hogs and pigs report that came out earlier today from the USDA. Uh, we've got a record number of folks uh, signed up and participating here. Thank you, all of you, for uh, your engagement. And uh, we'll have the opportunity to do some Q&A uh, with, uh, with the spokespeople at the end of our presentations today. So be thinking about your questions as we move into that. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Nate, if you'll advance the slides. Um, our speakers here today are Rupert Claxton uh, from JIRA. He's based in London. So Rupert's up late tonight, to about a six, seven hour time difference there. Going to talk about the global uh, market implications, particularly the situation he sees developing in Europe. We have Joe Kearns with Partners for Production Agriculture. Going to talk about what does this all mean to us as, as pork producers. And then, as I mentioned, Dr. Steve Meyer, with also with Partners for Production Ag, is going to go through the hogs and pigs report numbers and some of the implications there. So on the next slide, talk about uh, antitrust. So all the work that all organizations do uh, for, for the pork industry all pay very close attention to the Sherman Act. And when you have competitors uh, on, whether in meetings or in virtual gatherings like this, we wanna make sure that we abide by the antitrust rules here at the United States and the US Department of Justice. So as you ask questions uh, throughout the course of the, of the presentation today, um, I will try to sort through them, and if there's a question that looks like it could uh, raise antitrust issues, I'm probably just not going to bring it up. So in the next slide, uh, particularly with the National Pork Board, uh, your pork checkoff is paying for this webinar, and it's designed to help you understand the industry and do a better job running your business. And at the end of the day, the views expressed by our guest speakers are theirs and not those of the National Pork Board, because we do not advocate or endorse any particular production or market direction. I'd like to go ahead and get started with uh, Rupert Claxton. So Rupert, thank you so very much for joining us from London. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background and your credentials and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Oh, good, good afternoon, Bill, and thank you. Uh, I, I'm the, the Livestock and Meat Director at JIRA. JIRA is a worldwide consultancy based just outside of Geneva. We work specifically across the agricultural sectors. And I think a few of you will have seen me crop up talking about China and the impacts of markets in Asia and the work that I've done with the National Port Board over the last two or three years, looking at export opportunities and where we can go. And obviously, we're, we're closer to home for this Ukraine uh, war and the crisis that is, is brewing off the back of it. And, and the first thing just to say, and I've, I've only got 20 minutes to give you a brief update, uh, is that in Europe, this is felt much more closely than it is around the rest of the world. The, the European consumers, the market has taken it badly. Uh, and this, this feels like war in Europe. I mean, it is war in Europe, but it, it's very close to home. Um, and that, that's reflected in what we're seeing in consumer confidence in the way that the markets are thinking. But also there are some, some real knock-on effects that, that you won't see in the US that, that we are definitely experiencing. So with that said, I'm gonna roll through this presentation. Uh, I hope the screen advances in a minute. And I've broken this out into two basic sections. The first is to talk about the Ukraine war and, and three basic sectors there, the economic impact, because I think you need to know the numbers to appreciate how that, that transfers into the global markets. Then I want to talk about feed because we spent the last month digging through the numbers. And for me, this is a feed story. It's not so much about meat production out of either Russia or the Ukraine. They're important, but it's not the key. I'll talk a little about the meat market impact because it's relevant and you, you ought to understand why I say it's about feed. Then I'm gonna step out of that very quickly and give you a global price snapshot. Really, I'm just gonna show you Europe and China because they're the things that I've, I've got a, a frame of reference for today and it fits in with what I'm talking about and the time. And I'll leave you with a few final thoughts and hopefully I'll get done in time, promise. So the Ukraine war. We'd all seen it brewing. No one really seriously expected the Russians to step into the Ukraine. And I was sat with uh, Miratorg in uh, Gulf Food in Dubai the week beforehand. And they looked at me and said, it's not going to happen. We're not going to do this. And here we are today. So the world was caught somewhat flat-footed by this, although the signals were there. 
The first thing to think about is exchange rates. Obviously, they have a massive impact on the cost of product going in and out of these markets. And so in the case of the Ukraine, they can't move things in or out very easily at the moment. There is still product uh, coming across into the EU27, along with 4 million refugees to date. That's as of today, which has a massive knock-on effect in the markets around, especially in Poland. So the exchange rate against the Ukrainian, and I can't even pronounce the currency, I'm afraid, hasn't moved an awful lot. If we look at against the ruble, that's a very different story. We're looking at the US dollar versus the ruble. I did this presentation or a version of it two weeks ago as we were building up through this. The ruble had lost 60% against the dollar at that stage. That means that agricultural inputs, ag chemicals, feed additives, genetics going into Russia had got seriously expensive. And companies were looking at whether or not they could continue to afford to bring them in, even if they could get them in around various trade embargoes, restrictions, and the fact that ships just weren't going off the main shipping lines. So all sorts of complications. Now that's come back it's at about 23%. So the ruble has strengthened from its very weakest point there at the 7th to the 3rd. That's the 7th of March. For, for you that put the dates around the wrong way, I can't help that. Uh, so a stronger ruble because they didn't default on their loans that were expected. But the reality is, that they're in a very weak position compared to where they were. This was already before the war, a weak Russian ruble. So they were already at a disadvantage, but it does mean product coming out of Russia is more competitive. So that's feed wheats that are exported. It's chicken meat uh, going into China and a variety of other products, including oil and gas that uh, earn them better in rubles. So exchange rates important. And this was, it's not to allow the 13th, these graphs are till the 28th, apologies. Oil price, another massive thing that's come out of the back of this. And again, this oil price chart is up to the 28th, not the 14th. I updated it for this. Um, and what you see there is that the oil price surge, we saw that passed on at not just the gas pumps, um, but also all the way through in terms of ag inputs, we're seeing it uh, in terms of transport costs, we're seeing it in the plastics. So that's beginning to, to, to go across the entire chain now. The oil price fell back under $100 a barrel and has gone up to about 106. It's fluctuating at the moment. The world is finding a way to balance it, but we're still seeing markets buying. India is buying a lot of oil out of Russia. The reality is some countries cannot afford not to buy Russian oil. They need cheap oil, and at the moment, this is their best route to it. So Russia is earning extra income because when you take this back into rubles, not only has the oil price gone up 14% now where it was pre-war, but the ruble's weaker by 24%. So there's a win there. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got to think about what it means in Europe. Uh, gas price coming into Europe and the restrictions on gas going forward mean that Germany especially is really exposed 50% of their gas coming out of Russia. Uh, European gas prices are soaring, the oil price is soaring. There's a huge impact on the fertilizer cost because gas is really important in the production of fertilizer. So we see that going forward. We've got to think about this, this sort of compounding effect of various costs going up. So we're seeing across the system, fertilizer, feed, energy, transportation, nearly everything is bearing this oil price at the moment. So thinking about fertilizer, it was already expensive before we came into this situation. It's now really very expensive. I'll show you in a minute that Russia is a big supplier to the world market on top of this gas price situation. Some farms or many farms had bought forward for 2022. So the fertilizer, going on the ground now in Europe was bought last year. A lot of that was bought at not such high prices. And we're in around this $250 mark they were buying last year. Now to replace that fertilizer for next growing season, we're talking about upward of $900 for some products. That's really serious for the European growers. And I think we're seeing that globally. What does that mean? It means farms are gonna buy less because they're looking at those prices. They're not convinced the grain price will hold up. And farmers are naturally conservative. So what we're seeing is lower application rates. We're seeing a change in the way fertilizers are used. What it means is that we're going to see lower yields going into the year ahead. So there's going to be less grain as we come out of this growing season and therefore higher grain prices going over into 2023. That's as we read it. Why is the fertilizer price so sensitive? Well, Russia is one of the major producers. And this is a, it's a bit of a hash, this graph, if I'm really honest with you about it. We're just looking at the a big collective under the basic HS fertilizer codes as to who the big exporters are. And Russia, Russia is the big supplier of ammonia production worldwide. It's 23%, potash is 21, and it's 14% of urea. So not only is it a big exporter of finished fertilizer products, 
It's a big exporter of completed fertilizer. And Russia is trying to restrict the amount of fertilizer that goes out onto the world market, in part to protect its own prices, but also it's worried about the influence it has. It wants to use them to restrict the world market. And it's also a little nervous about leaving it in ports. They're closely remembering what happened in Beirut. And without shipping working, they're concerned about where that goes. China has done the same thing. China, at the end of last year, restricted fertilizer exports to protect its domestic stock. Hence, we see these high prices. So fertilizer, really nervous, and it has not gone into feed. Like, uh, hang on, I've gone. There we go. Controls. Sorry. So a quick look at the, uh, the commodity price, if I can make the thing stabilize. There we go. So I've just grabbed out of the Financial Times the, the, the commodity price charts, and they're up to the 28th of, uh, of March again. And the point I want to make here is that they have gone up and they were going up before the war. Okay, So this wasn't that they were in a falling situation. We were already tight. The world was already concerned about what the feed outlook would be in 2022. We know it's very dry, dry in, um, in North America. China's reporting that they've got some concerns about the conditions there as well. Feed prices were already pushing up. Clearly, the, the outbreak of war pushed speculation. Prices go higher. And now we're really concerned about supply in the world market. A transfer of buyers is inevitable. We are not going to lose Russian exports to the world market as a result of this, but they're going to flow to different places. There are some countries that just can't afford not to buy from Russia. If I, if I talk to a trader in Egypt, they have to buy affordable grain to keep people fed. It's not about geopolitics. It's just about food. The other thing we're seeing is some countries putting export bans on. Hungary is already discussing not exporting to the rest of Europe. Ireland is encouraging domestic planting to, to increase domestic grain production. The world is suddenly acutely aware of food security, which is interesting. In terms of, and there's too much data here to really present to you, yellow boxes are the Ukraine, the red is Russia. And what you see if we look across corn, maize for the Europeans, wheat, barley, sunflower oil seed, soy, soybean and rapeseed, is that Russia and the Ukraine feature quite heavily. In fact, in terms of corn, Russia isn't significant. Ukraine is about 3% of, of global production. These are production figures. In terms of wheat, Russia's 10, Ukraine's 4. Barley, they're 12 and 7. Sunflower seeds, really important. 31% for the Ukraine, 27% for Russia. I'm less concerned about Russia because, as I said, they'll just go elsewhere. We're going to see some transfer of trade. The Ukraine, though, production could be, it's not going to be zero this year, but it could be down between 20 and 80%. And the longer the war drags on, the more inclined I am to go towards 80%, not 20%. Decline in production. That's significant. And so this has a further impact on, on fuel and commodity price speculation. If I just flip this over and go, okay, what does that look like from an export scenario? Then suddenly Russia's the biggest wheat exporter in the world. We're not that concerned. But Ukraine, 9% of global wheat. In terms of corn, 15% of the trade. Soybeans, not significant. Rapeseed, 10%, that's significant in the European market. Sunflower oil, 47% of the global traded volume. So that's really important. And the Ukraine has banned exports of wheat, oats, millet, buckwheat, sugar, salt, meat, because they're really concerned about food security at home. We're seeing the Russians attacking food depots, freezer centers. They've got to keep what food they have in the country. The reality is no one will send a port to a ship to a port in the Ukraine, and you can't get a ship out of a port in the Ukraine even if you send one there. Russia continues to trade. Where does the Ukraine ship to? This is worth bearing in mind. Not a lot into North America. So directly, you're not going to miss what comes in. And these donut charts show the scale uh, of the trade into each market, and then the segmentation shows the products they ship. So into Europe, they ship quite a lot of corn, a bit of wheat, a little bit of rapeseed. It's not a major disruptor within the European market. It's going to be missed, no question. It's about 12 million tons of product uh, of uh, import supply. Africa, much more significant, especially when we're talking about the poor African countries. They need to look elsewhere for product. Notably into the Asian markets and also into the Middle East. And the question is, if these guys have to look elsewhere for feed, they're going to come to North America and Brazil, which means they're going to take some of your supply and lift prices. So it's the knock-on effect for the North American market you need to think about. In terms of production, why are we so negative about what gets produced this year? This map shows where the Russians were on the 6th of March. They haven't moved massively since then, thankfully. Uh, but what you, if you look on the right, then the green charts here show 
where the key corn production regions are. The red circle shows where the Russians are. The wheat production area with the red circle for the Russians sitting in there as well. The winter wheats were already in the ground, but everything else is yet to be planted. They're struggling to get tractors into fields. They can't drill at night when they normally would plant at night because they're worried about drone attacks. They haven't got diesel because either side, the military is taking the diesel because they need it for tanks. They're having products stolen off farm. Their workers have gone to fight. The workers that haven't gone to fight have fled. I, I was an email contact with somebody the other day who said that out of 2,200 staff on their farm, they had 200 left. So that's significant as to what we can expect in the year ahead. What does it mean on the meat markets before I run out of time? Why am I not massively concerned about the direct impact of supply of meat globally? So this is the Ukraine meat uh, situation, if you like. This is what they consume at home. Generally, per capita consumption of meat uh, is, is quite low. Um, disposable incomes aren't huge. Chicken is the main meat, followed by pork. The chart below, which we've lost the title to, is, oh, it's up the top here, is exports. These are export volumes annualized, and you see a big surge in, as they developed a chicken industry, a broiler chicken industry. Uh, and a big push into exports, up over 500,000 tons. And most of that is chicken, just short of 500,000 tons of product weight of chicken. Stagnating. That's not going to be exported. So if we look into the, the period ahead, what we find is that consumption in the Ukraine comes crashing down because they can't afford it and it's not produced. And exports just disappear because they haven't got access to export markets. In terms of pork, it's not that significant. The production stalls and falls. Pigs are killed early on both sides to feed the armies. Little restocking is cash flow falters and, and you can't get hold of the, the pigs to bring in and restock. No effective pork exports anyway due to ASF, but they do import pork from Europe and from Russia. And it's possible that they'll continue to buy from, from Europe in terms of aid. So we might see Europe pushing some pork into the market to try and make sure that people are fed. Poultry production plummets, same kind of problem, but we've now got serious issues around uh, power supply, especially for hatcheries, but also for feeding but, and freezers. We've got slaughterhouses disrupted, consumption supported by lost export volume, but we're seeing freezer centers bomb. So we've got real problems. And on top of that, we've got staff problems, infrastructure problems, inf uh, inputs, cash flow, uh, and theft. So a whole range of problems that mean this industry is really not likely to export significantly in, in the near future. And if we just look at where those poultry exports go, then MENA, this is the Middle East and North Africa, the major market. Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Europe here capped at about 70,000 tons by a quota. These markets will be backfilled by Brazil. So the Brazilian chicken can go into those markets, they'll enjoy uh, less restrictions. And certainly in terms of the European market, there's a problem there with uh, high levels of HPI this winter. So imports are needed. But again, we are gonna miss the, the exports from the Ukraine, I think for the next five years. Why are we not? flapping and worrying about Russia. Well, Russia's not a massive exporter. It's not been a massive importer for some time. There were some signals sent this year that they would like to import more and they'd increase the import quotas. The reality is the weak ruble makes that very difficult for them to achieve. And so the Brazilians were the people likely to send more there. The reality, I think, is that they can't afford it, to be honest. So we're not going to see that going in. Exports aren't a massive part of, of the Russian system. Consumption, I think, will fall in Russia. The reality of that fall in consumption is, is basically economic. Consumers are going to have less disposable income as a really reflecting a very weak ruble, higher energy costs within Russia, higher costs on nearly everything uh, and, and, and job losses. So what we're looking at is a much weaker Russian consumer market. Those products going out at export will be competitive because of the weak ruble. But where are they going to go? They can ship a bit into the Middle East. They already do in terms of chicken. Port really goes to their neighboring markets and it will probably continue to do so. Uh, and China will buy chicken from them. But they don't ship uh, pork out into China because they've got ASF. Uh, they also ship pork to Vietnam. That could increase notably as well. They will be very cost competitive. And you can see the challenges for the Russians. They've got a lower feed cost. They did all the way through last year due to export restrictions on feed. That persists today. They've got labor. They haven't got a labor challenge like the rest of Europe. Uh, they've got an inputs problem, though. Additives, veterinary genetics, spare parts, even with embargoes from people like Case and John Deere, not able to supply parts from the US. That means that their tractors can't be maintained. 
We've got the same thing on, on cutting lines, slaughter lines, right the way through the system. So increased costs in US dollar terms, massive problem for them. Their market challenges, rising costs hard to pass along. You've got a consumer being squeezed. How do you push that cost on? So I'm really concerned about where the Russian market is for the Russian producers. But at a global uh, standpoint, it's not going to be the thing that causes us sleepless nights. So step back, something slightly different for a minute. Global price snapshot. This is the European average class ENS that there are classification for carcass prices on pigs. And I just wanted to show you the trend. It's been very different to the US. This low period at the end of 2021 that carried over into the start of this year has been really negative for the European pork industry across every European market. We've seen massive on-farm losses. We've seen a reduction in production. We've seen farmers looking at coming out of the industry and real concern about the future. Huge signal change in direction. When Tun is the major German slaughter company, filed a, sent a letter to their major buyers saying, we are not going to supply you with pork under the terms of the contracts. The prices have to go up because we've got to keep farmers farming. So they've pushed a price increase into the market that's enabling them to pay more for their pigs. And we've seen that echo across Europe and up goes the average price. It's a really interesting thing. We need more time to discuss that another day. China, on the other end of the world, very quick update. We are waiting for this rebound in prices. And you can see the ASF price list lift here. The red and the green lines show you the, uh, the meat and the live pig prices. So the green line is the meat price running through the blue line is piglets. I could have taken it out. Really high prices through 2020. They fell famously through last year. You will all have discussed those to death, I'm sure. Little bounce at the end of last year. Some hope, and it's tailed away. They have a huge COVID problem at the moment in China. Shanghai, the entire city is in lockdown. That's, that's massive. And what that does to Chinese consumer confidence in a country that believe they'd beaten COVID and were untouched by it is really the question. I saw a, an article two weeks ago that said KFC had a thousand outlets shut because they were in COVID restriction zones. So I think there's a massive demand impact that's holding this Chinese price down again through this year. We're expecting to see that start to lift towards the end of the second quarter. We're still expecting to see that because they're reducing uh, their breeding herd. And so we watch and wait and see what happens. So expecting better prices in China as we look into the second half of the year. And really, that's where the rally starts. OK, final thoughts, because I'm just about out of time. The first thing is perspective. With everything that's happening and, and the world on fire and our heads bubbling, step back, look at some long range data. And it's worth doing occasionally. One of my colleagues was, oh, I've never seen prices like this. And I was like, look, just, just relax. Because if we go all the way back to 2010 and 12, and they were still in college, to be fair, we've seen the prices before. We've been through this experience. The question is, how do we come out of it? How do the markets react? How much of this do we pass on to consumers? And what does it mean for general inflation? So we've got to watch all of these things. We've seen it in feed prices. We've seen it in oil prices. So a little perspective means that the industry can plan and think, and we can learn from what we've seen before. There is no question, though. Harvest outlook looks poor going into this summer. Concern about what that means for the feed situation going into not just this year, but the start of next year. Clear that the war in the Ukraine has turbocharged the situation. Expectation that feed prices stay high into 2023 and 2024, possibly. Does that give the farmers confidence to put some of that precious fertilizer on the crops and try and bolster yields a bit? Let's hope so. OK, final page of conclu conclusions. Rampant general inflation and serious squeeze on disposable incomes. They're probably our biggest concerns right now. The immediate impact of the Ukraine war, the global meat and livestock centers on two points. Higher feed costs, far higher energy costs. Those things are what are really going to squeeze the consumer. Ukrainian grain and oilseed exports under any scenario are minimized in 2022, we can basically park them and we're not going to see anything out of Ukraine. Notable pressure on wheat and sunflower oil. They're the things that get most affected. Fertilizer. This could really be the limiting factor. High costs reduce use and therefore production. Repercussions as countries limit exports to manage domestic availability. And at what cost? Are we going to see some of the really big exporters holding product at home? Does that become political? Neither countries are major meat exporters. I'm talking here about Russia and Ukraine, but both important grain exporters. 
Russia will continue to export grains and meat, but not to the EU or US. Ukraine has a growing re or had a growing regional poultry export and grain. Both have stopped and are unlikely to re recover in the short, probably even in the medium term. Global meat consumption decline as inflation squeezes consumer spending. This is a serious problem everywhere, and it doesn't matter where we look. High oil prices are making consumers think about where they spend their money. Most apparent in developing markets where feed cost hikes will limit production, pricing some consumers out. And so if I think about the example I gave of Egypt, we know that some of those consumers in Egypt are just not going to eat as much meat. Some won't eat any meat for a period because they can't afford it. So we've got to think about how that reflects on the global market. Time and resources. We've got to think about where we're going, the impact that they have. Where does it take us to? So there's an awful lot we could talk about. I've run slightly over time. Apologies. Thank you for, for listening. I'm going to hand over now to Joe Kearns, who's going to try and take some of what I've been talking about and make it relevant to you in the US. So it's been great to talk to you. Don't forget to put some questions in the box at the bottom. And Joe, over to you. Thank you. Rupert, that was absolutely fascinating uh, what you went through there. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to uh, start to parlay onto that about what does a pork producer do inside of this environment. So I, I've just kind of titled this one this this big rock that hits our small pond and this big rock representing uh, the Ukrainian situation, uh, the small pond kind of being what what does our agricultural markets what do our agricultural markets look like and I'll kind of start to put that in perspective here and and, and try to draw some conclusions. Uh, but that was an absolutely excellent overview of where uh, where we sit right now and, and where these impacts uh, might start to lead us. Uh, one second here. I need to get on my share screen. I just, uh, let's do this. Uh, okay. You got me or not? Nope. Okay. There you go. Let me just see if that works. That does not here. Uh, how about this? Nate. Uh, if Nate, if you're uh, if you're running the screen, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we are licensed brokers, so both Steve and I are governed by the rules of the CFTC. Uh, the, what we share is our opinion, and therefore, if uh, if trades are made based on that, that is at your own peril. Uh, Nate, can you give me one more click here, please? So when we take a look, and I want to try to put some perspective around this, about where are we as far as the aggregate open interest uh, of the corn market specifically here is about $45 billion. And we're going to put this all in perspective here. Uh, but as you can see, on or about uh, the 24th of February, you, you saw a huge spike in that, in that uh, uh, volume side of it. Uh, the open interest has largely stayed steady, but but in times of uncertainty, what we tend to have is people uh, starting to pull back. And so we haven't had a whole lot of trade, and therefore the trade that we do have has a much larger impact on prices uh, than what we might otherwise anticipate here. And if we go to the next slide, what you're going to see is, is how that relates back over to the hog market, please here, Nate. There you go. Is you've got uh, uh, open interest value of hogs is about Ten billion dollars, kind of at the top end there, and as you can see, that uh, we we really didn't have much of an impact as far as when the Ukrainian situation began uh, for volume or open interest. But notice what happened there uh, in the middle of March is we had an increase in volume, but largely those were folks that were exiting stage left. Is that line that represents open interest fell down? And if you give me one more click, this is really kind of the poignant side. Is, is remember that what we had is you had $45 billion in asset value or an open interest in corn, about 10 billion. And this whole thing is really about what goes on with crude oil. Crude oil, just in the three major exchanges inside of the United States, represents a $500 billion market. And so when I talk about the big rock into the small pond, it's trying to put those things into perspective. Give me one more advance here, please, if you would, Nate. And so um, uh, I put an arrow in there about what happened to crude prices. And, and this is, uh, Rupert had a little bit longer timeline, but you can see uh, on or about the time that the election took place is that we were rocking along someplace in the, in the 60 to $70 range. Not a huge surprise. Uh, current administration came in uh, with the explicit goal of addressing the, the climate policy, carbon, 
uh, 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 almost penalizing, if you will, traditional crude oil markets in, in order to favor some renewables. This, this is not a huge surprise. And you saw this nice little steady uptick. Uh, and, then, and then all of a sudden, uh, the impact of the Putin invasion gave us this huge spike in prices. And we've been vacillating ever since. Give me another click, please. But what you really find out is that within our markets, within the corn market, uh, I've identified we, we did have a huge spike and then actually a downturn the next day. But when you aggregate this, and this is as of the close yesterday when I submitted the slides, is we've had some place in the neighborhood of a 20 cent rise in the price of corn. In the big scheme of things, uh, and certainly that we've had uh, the dry weather that came through South America that gave us the, the largest impetus as far as the price movement was concerned. Uh, but we, we really haven't seen that much disturbance. If we go over to the, the uh, soy slide, which is the next one, please you'll see that we're actually trading at values that are lower. This is as of yesterday afternoon uh, than when the Ukrainian invasion uh, was initiated. So uh, when, when you look at this, this is largely an energy drive market that has not had the same impact yet on our commodity markets. I, I do think that taking heed of what Rupert shared with us uh, about what's going on across the balance of the world and what it might eventually mean to U.S. prices is uh, a, a very sane type of approach. And one more click will get us into what's going on as far as the hogs are concerned, uh, because we've seen uh, uh, June hogs that were trading on about $115. Uh, we closed uh, uh, yesterday afternoon at about $125. Uh, the report out this afternoon that Steve will address here after I'm done uh, certainly gives us uh, some, some reasons for optimism as the values have come in significantly less in some cases uh, uh, relative to pre-report guesses. And so if we start to round this out, uh, Nate, if you give me a click, please. About what does this mean? And, and so the first thing that you've got is if you take that corn, so I'm, and I'm using kind of a standard crush model here, that corn uh, uh, or corn consumption is roughly uh, 10 bushels per pig. And so that 20 cents per bushel is about $2 a pig. On the soybean meal side, please, on another click, uh, gets you uh, uh, about 75 cents. And I'm using about 150 pounds per. And then on the, on the hog side of it, uh, one more time, please, is that you're going to see is that that hog run up of about $9 a hundredweight on a 210 pound carcass is $19 a pig up. So you've got the two reds that are working against you, the black that's working in your favor. And give me one more click because when you net this all out, what you're going to discover is that, is that we're up $16 a pig plus or minus, uh, which would also represent, according to Dr. Meyer's uh, calculations of 2022, with or without this particular event, uh, was on cue to become the second largest uh, revenue item for the, the pork production, the biggest since 2014. Our, our previous second had been 2021. And so if we just play stop the music right here, uh, which you do have an opportunity to do as a pork producer by, by uh, taking the revenue that's afforded by the Board of Trade as well as uh, buying the commodities on the Board of Trade, is this is not all about what could be, it's about what is. And, and I find this to be um, uh, more of an observation than anything else. But, uh, but, but since the Ukrainian invasion, it's actually been a net positive to pork producers, something that, that, that perhaps uh, we didn't think about. Give me another click, please. So, so we've got all of this uncertainty, and uh, uh, I think this might be one of the greatest opportunities that we've ever seen inside of pork production. If you give me one more click, it's kind of the what's the why behind the what here. Uh, and, and those of you that are old enough to remember good old uh, Jack Palance from uh, uh, City Slickers, it, it's one thing is, is what he was trying to convey to Billy Crystal at the time. And give me one more click here. And that one thing is, is that the revenue side uh, really drives our business. And they, give me, give me a, a, like five clicks, get to the bottom here so I can just kind of walk through here. Um, and, and I started with the assumptions. And the assumptions would be that in normal times here, in kind of a, a, a generic scenario where our cost of production uh, is, is in the neighborhood of $80 per hundredweight on a break even, and you've got an $85 market, an $11 ahead profit. Most of us, I think, would raise our hand and say, I would take that, uh, this $11 ahead profit, uh, if I could handle that. And so let, let's kind of start to, 
to tease this out here. And so I gave you a hypothetical scenario where soybean meal doubles in price. It goes from $400 a ton up to $800 a ton and kind of using my same crush model that I evaluated with earlier, that's about a $30 per pig impact to the negative. And if you uh, push this forward into the corn, uh, again, a hypothetical scenario that takes corn up from $6 a bushel, uh, where, where the, the, the new crop values are uh, $6.50 right now, up to $12 a bushel. Well, that's a $60 impact to the negative. Uh, if you take another one and just, uh, and we're gonna double the price of our revenue piece, uh, moving from 85 to a new record of 170. And Nate, if you give me one more click, it's gonna give us the bottom line there, is that we're going to go $185 to the positive. So if we just double the price of, not just double, if we double the price of everything, it's a $90 negative, but it's $185 positive. And, and so my, I think my conclusion here is that pork production is so incredibly dependent upon uh, the revenue side of our business that even with these upcoming disruptions that, that quite frankly have not really materialized into our U.S. market yet, uh, but if we take heed to the presentation that you just heard, it might be time to start taking a look at protection rolling forward. And then I just peeked over my shoulder here. Uh, D23 is about $6. D24 is about $5.50. There are opportunities still, even if you miss this first wave, that there are opportunities. Advance, please, Nate. So uh, uh, one of the items that we have, and this has been a relatively recent addition. So in, in about 2020, uh, the administration rolled out a, an increase in their subsidy level uh, of uh, livestock insurance. And this applies both to pork as well as the cattle uh, producers are concerned. But the calculation is much, much different than the crop insurance tables. And Nate, if you give me one more click, and the difference is, is that instead of a static value, is we're trading against options every day. And, and we've got two different programs, and we're going to kind of walk through these here uh, very, very briefly. But I think the bottom line is, uh, that you must understand options in order to understand livestock insurance. And so, Nate, please advance. So you've got two of them. So the, the one that we call LRM, or excuse me, LRP, or Livestock Risk Protection, is subsidized at the levels that you've got on the right side of the chart. It is subsidized as a percentage of the value. You can pick and choose. Uh, this this uh, occurs on a daily basis is that we can put this LRP coverage on. A uh, couple of, of just key points here. This is uh, the full faith of the USDA. Uh, it's governed by the exact same agency that runs your crop insurance. Um, and, and the uh, premiums are not due until after you market those animals. So therefore, there's no margin call associated with this product. And, and it's after you've received the revenue check uh, that, that you either pay the premium or receive the indemnity. And the next one, please, Nate, is uh, something we call LGM, livestock gross margin. And this takes into consideration both the value of corn and soybean meal relative to the price of the animal. And it, and it runs it through a matrix here. Uh, and it is also subsidized if you let your uh, you take your your 50% uh, uh, subsidy up to. So these are the and these are 50% of uh, the options values that we're trading against. These are fantastic tools for the producer. And, that, and that's on on the current way that we sit. And if you give me one more click, Nate, here, they're not only fantastic right now, but they're going to get better. So let's give me a, give me a few more clicks here. Uh, where it's going to get better and keep going here is we've got some changes. The, uh, the, the crop year is, is starts in July 1st of each year. Uh, the LRP uh, maximums right now are 150,000 head, and those are moving to 750,000 head. So it encompasses a very, very large uh, uh, production community is able to utilize uh, these programs. Right now, as we sit, you've got to designate. You've got to either pick one program or the other. Starting in July, you're going to be able to use them both. Now, a couple things is you can't cover the same hogs with each program, and you have to have separate months of expiration. But even with those caveats, it is a, it is a fantastic program. Uh, please advance, Nate. So let's kind of tie this all together there. As a pork producer, you're facing risks every single day. We've got uh, the Supreme Court that's taken up the Prop 12 situation. Uh, Dr. Meyer will, will often go through what is, what is the fickle nature or, or not therein of demand. Uh, we have experienced as, as recently as 2020, the operational capacity being compromised because of COVID and, and, and for shutting down the entire uh, city of Shanghai, which is a massive, massive place. 
uh, I think we've got to take heed. And we've also got that dreaded ASF at our doorstep on a daily basis. And give me one more click here, please. And if anybody read my National Hog Farmer article that I put out last week, it was all about that it's okay to say, I don't know, because with what's going on in the world situation, it's impossible to do anything with confidence. However, against that backdrop, I would contend that it's not okay to do nothing, especially given the margin that we've got going forward here, the tools that you have at your avail. You've now got a very, very positive hogs and pigs report that's coming out is this is not a time for hope. We had a, we had a, a president in 08 that ran on, on a, a platform of hope and it worked very, very well. I would prefer to say this is a time for action and for pork producers, it's a time for action and it's an incredibly profitable time. And with that, I believe that's my last slide, please. I would put myself back on to mute and uh, hand the floor over to Dr. Meyer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Rupert. Thanks, Joe, for covering the really big picture issues here. I'm gonna get a little bit more of a zeroed in here and talk about uh, today's March Hogs and Pigs report and what the implications are for that for supplies and kind of where we are going forward here. Okay, let's go to the first one. Uh, we got the uh, disclaimer statement, I think, that Joe showed you a few minutes ago. So we'll pop right on through that. And then we'll go to the actual Hogs and Pigs report data. Uh, this is the data out of today's paper, uh, today's report. Uh, the uh, pre-report estimates from analysts are in the second from the right column, and the right-hand column is the difference between today's actual numbers and what was expected by these analysts going into the report. Uh, you can see that all of the numbers are negative except for one, and it's zero. Uh, that is bullish. I mean, clearly the numbers were lower than what we uh, expected going in. Now, this is the expectations of the surveyed economists or analysts that uh, were in this, this small sample, and it's a pretty small sample. There were only six observations in there. There used to be a lot more of us doing these kind of things, but there aren't now. And so that's all we have. It, did that represent the, the attitude of the futures market? That's a question. And I've uh, kind of questioned whether the pre-report survey did represent the, the market sentiment. Uh, in recent quarterly reports, uh, I don't know the answer to this one. Uh, it's been every now and then we get one that says it's bullish and we uh, we take prices down on the open the next day and vice versa. Uh, I think this one was bullish and I think we'll see prices go up tomorrow because of it, because it's so consistently bullish across, uh, across there. Shows that we still have a declining breeding herd, 6.098 million head, uh, down uh, almost 2% from last year. And that's about one, a little over 1% down from uh, where we were in December. Uh, the um, haul hogs and pigs, 98% of a year ago, kept for marketing about the same number. Notice that in the, in the uh, distribution of weight categories, uh, the large shortfalls versus a year ago are in the heavier weight categories, as was expected. The 180 and over at minus 3.8 is within shooting distance of actual slaughter since March 1st, which was down 4.4%. Uh, I don't think that's enough difference to call anything into question. The DSFED farrowings fit the breeding herd quite well. USDA hadn't been very close on that number in the last couple of reports. March, May intentions also fit well, so do June and August. So those kind of fit. If you take, uh, if you take the DSFED farrowings and the DSFED uh, Pigs per litter, you come up with a DSFED pig crop that also fits. So this thing is internally consistent. It is uh, kind of across the board uh, below what was expected. I would judge it as a bullish report. And I I'm not sure it's enough to get a limit move tomorrow, but uh, it'll be a pretty healthy one in my opinion. Go to the next one. This is a graphical presentation of those same numbers. And I think it really is good. It uh, was come up with by a young man on our staff, Cody Good. Does a great job for us. but uh, the gray bars are the range of the estimates. The blue is the average of the estimates. The orange is the actual numbers on a percentage of a year ago basis. And you can see all the orange ones are, are virtually all of them are off the uh, left end, the low end of the numbers, or toward that. The only one that's really close to the where, where uh, uh, analysts were was the 120 to 179s, which we saw that the difference was zero there. Uh, one number in here was kind of particularly a bit disappointing to me, and that is pig save per litter at 100%. Uh, we had kind of shifted back to growth in the last quarterly report, plus 1.3%. Uh, 
Um, we've gone through a period with the COVID shutdowns where we made decisions to not raise as many pigs per litter, but uh, we've got a genetic capability out there that I think could be better than this. But the USDA is finding that we didn't do that very well. We didn't we didn't really improve that much uh, in the, in this quarter relative to a year ago. One point I will make before we go on: there were very there were very few revisions and not very large revisions to this report, which did not surprise me. The slaughter numbers have fit uh, USDA's uh, reports. The last couple of quarters, especially last quarter, has been quite close. And uh, we're kind of through all the year-over-year -year screwy numbers that have been given us because of coronavirus and pig backups and all those kind of things. And so I think we have a pretty good baseline uh, to compare numbers to in this report. If we go to the next one, this shows you weekly slaughter and kind of what these numbers indicate. Uh, the, the brown line there would be out of the hogs and pigs report, the March hogs and pigs report that you just got today, using percentage change versus a year ago and um, measuring that off of slaughter a year ago. And again, we were pretty well through the pig backups uh, a year ago. We had a few packer raised pigs that were still backed up on farms, but we were close enough to the end of it that I think using these year over year comparisons makes sense. A couple of things jumps out at you on this on this chart. First, the shortfalls relative to a year ago really kind of come to an end in July. And then we're back to year ago numbers. We get it slightly above them by the end of the year, uh, but not by much. The second one is that those slaughter numbers, once we get to September, uh, run into the 2.629 uh, uh, slaughter capacity figure of last fall and go above it just a bit. But that's not a concern to me. And the reason it is, is number one, is we can run above that rated weekly capacity with large Saturdays. That's That number assumes 5.4 work days per week. And we do have plants that are ramping their line speeds back up uh, to increase that capacity number uh, back toward the 2.768 million head that we had in the fall of 2020. Now, it won't go all the way back to there because we lost a plant in Gwaltney, Virginia in the meantime, but still uh, we have three plants that have gotten waivers on the China and the line speed uh, situation and are increasing from the 1106 that's represented in the green line for these plants. And uh, we'll have some more of those get waivers, we think, as we go through the, the rest of the spring and summer. And so those plants will be running back up. Uh, you know, they could run back to their pre- uh, court decision uh, levels last summer. Uh, of In one case, I know of one plant that was uh, at 1106, they had operated at 1320 uh, before the, the courts had slowed them down in this uh, disagreement over the way the rules were written for the new mine inspection system. So uh, that's a positive for us. We'll have, I think we're going to have uh, significant and ample uh, slaughter capacity to handle these pigs come the fall. So uh, in, in summary, and I think that's my last slide, um, um, this um, is, uh, there's the Q&A thing again. If you have a question, please put it in and Bill will handle those in a moment. But um, this is a, a report that is, the numbers are lower than what we expected. I look for it to be bullish. Uh, they're bullish in my calculations, especially for the second half, because I had thought we would move back to some growth. Uh, a little bit of growth in the breeding herd, perhaps, and I was expecting substantial growth in uh, year over year growth in pigs per litter and farrowings per breeding animal. USDA says we're not going to get that. And if that's the case, then these numbers are going to continue to stay tight. And demand is excellent. I mean, I, I go through uh, every week, go through and look at the status of the cutout value and hog prices relative to a forecasting model and basically adjust that uh, to, to represent the strength or weakness of demand. In December, I was adjusting showing weakness. Now I'm adjusting showing strength again. And when I look at a scatter diagram of uh, per capita availability versus prices for this year, it's along the same line representing uh, representation of demand as we were one year ago. And that is the highest level of demand at the wholesale and farm level we've ever seen in this business. So demand is excellent. Supplies are tighter than what we thought. That means uh, uh, stronger prices. Whether those prices amount to what you see on the futures market now remains to be seen. 
uh, as the futures market obviously is very high relative to history. Uh, I think it's a good great thing on the revenue side for pork producers. Joe talked about what they're facing on costs. Uh, I just ran my model while Joe was talking a moment ago. Uh, the estimate from our model on cost of production is now $90 a hundredweight. And that really represents the low cost 25% of, of producers. Average producers are gonna be up in the 96, 97 range, given where corn and soybean meal futures are uh, as of last Friday. So uh, uh, a great revenue year and still a great profit year, by the way, uh, but uh, costs are certainly a challenge. 